amazing work in each one of our lives. He's begun the process of forming Christ in us. <coughs> Say that, Christ in me. Christ, Christ in me. The hope, the hope of glory. Yes, what an amazing thing that our Heavenly Father looked down on us and He said, live. You know, the, the scripture talks in Jeremiah about uh, an aborted child lying you know, dead in its blood, almost. And God said to that little one, live. And he, he, he raised this child up. Francis Chan talks about evangelism. He's got a great video called <clears throat> Rethinking Evangelism. If you, were, if you were going out to the cemetery and you're, you had one job, Harvey, you love this, right? One job. You have one job. <clears throat> Your job is to raise the dead. Who will you take with you? Who will you take with you to raise the dead? You'll take someone who has eternal life. You'll take Jesus Christ. You know, and, that, and evangelism is like that, right? I, I love to preach Jesus and see the light go on in people. And I'm assuming, guys, that every one of us in here is born again, right? You must be born again, or none of this makes sense. You can read the Bible till the cows come home. If you don't have the spirit of the living God in you, it doesn't make sense. But by God's grace, we have been born again because he put faith in our hearts, called us out of darkness into the light. Why? So that our Father would be glorified and so that we can bear much fruit. And I'm challenging myself daily, Lord, what kind of fruit am I bearing? Who am I discipling? You know, Randy's got uh, a program going on right now for discipleship, and I so applaud what he's about, because if we as the church here at First Baptist really want to reach our community, we have to first be in community. If I'm going to make disciples, it's incumbent on me to say yes to Jesus Christ, to submit myself to the authority of his word, to come into a living, dynamic, daily relationship with him so he is leading me and guiding me and giving me not my words, but his words. I was at a conference recently and they said, let the word do the work. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, right? So hope, that's, that's a, a bit about faith, hope. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in God. And, and we want to know Jesus Christ. We want to make him known. We want to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I want to pass this clicker to my son, Jonathan, or Daniel, or Julian, my son-in-law. And I want to say, you guys now go. Go and make disciples. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share what he has done in your life, in your family. Talk about some of the hard times, you know, that, uh, that you've gone through. 30 years ago, I was working construction all day and driving a pizza truck at night so that my family could eat, right? And we, we were subsisting on less than f uh, five figures a year, which really, it was rich, if you think about it in this country. We got many of our meals from the church's food pantry, just like we have here. God, God is faithful in those tough times. If we only will look to him, if we'll let him be the Lord of our life, if we will let him continue to call us to himself. Because see, repentance is day one of this life. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. This little teeny seed that God plants in our heart and it starts to grow. And it grows and it grows and it grows until one day it, it is all people see. And we want people to see Jesus Christ in our lives. We want Jesus to be exalted. We want our Father to be glorified. Amen? Amen. So what is hope? Where is your hope? Where does it come from? Again, hope. our hope is in God himself. Our hope is in the finished work that Jesus Christ did on that cross. When he spread out his arms and cried, it is finished, he had you in mind. He had me in mind. He wanted nothing more 
than the joy set before him. When you think about that joy, what was it? It was knowing, you know, knowing, Mason, that you would be with him forever. Clark, he knew that you and probably your kids and grandkids would be instructed in the word of the Lord, would grow up in the fear and admonition of God himself. He put his life on the line so that he could give us his eternal life. This is eternal life, that we would know God, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ and the work that he did there at Calvary. So hope, hope is great, a great, great promise. It's looking to what Jesus has said about you and me. When Jesus looks at you, what does he see? And I love this so much. When Jesus Christ looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. If indeed you are in Christ. Right? If any man is in Christ, he is a brand new creature. I'm not like the guy I was back at college. I'm not like the guy I was two years ago, to which my wife says, thank God. <laughs> right? He is constantly at work. He is changing us every day. And we should be constantly coming to him and allowing the Holy Spirit through the power of the word to work in us, to change us, to be more like our big brother, to reflect him. So hope is not, oh, I lost my phone, I hope I find it. Hope is not, hey, I hope you'll come to my party. You know, it's not, oh, I hope you'll be there Sunday. That's, those, are, those are whimsical hopes. You know, hope is cherishing something with anticipation. It's wanting something at a gut level to be true. But it's also much more than any kind of a vague wish that something will happen or, you know, we use it in English, might happen, right? But hope is this. Hope is a sure and confident expectation that God's future faithfulness and presence will be with us. What is the horizon of your hope? You know, I talk to a lot of people out in the community, and I ask them how they're doing, and they say, oh, just trying to make it, just trying to make it, just trying to make it through another day. We have such a better horizon, such a better hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. See, there's a great exchange that happens at the cross. God takes all of my sin and puts it on the Lamb of God. And his wrath is poured out, and Jesus cries, it is finished. Jesus cries, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? So that later he can say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, Dale. I'm always with you. My heart towards you is full of compassion, full of mercy. I'm going to finish the work that I started in you because of his great, great love for us. So Christ... Jesus and his work is the object of our hope. Our hope is in God himself. That is a firm foundation, brothers. The, the rock solid rock of Jesus Christ's work, of his perfect sacrifice on my behalf and yours. God who was and is and evermore shall be. God who created all things, seen and unseen. You know, here is hope. Here is hope. A sure, confident expectation. And our wonderful creator put all of, all of creation together and he made it perfect. And Adam and Eve were here in this garden and it was perfect. There was nothing they lacked for. Everything was beautiful. Everything worked just like it should. And then a character assassin shows up on the scene. And that's what Satan did. Satan impugned God's character to Adam and Eve. He said... Did God really say? Isn't he trying to keep you from something? Doesn't he want not the best for you? Which are all lies. You know, and, and we, we, when we get wrapped around the axle in our theology, it's because we really don't know God as our Heavenly Father. We don't know our Daddy, who is full of compassion and full of mercy, who has good plans for us. He told Jeremiah when he was going into Babylon... To suffer years of captivity, he said, Jeremiah, I know the plans for you, plans for a future, plans for a hope. Go into that city, build houses, marry, have children, seek the good of the city. Why? Because God wanted a witness in Babylon. And we are living today, I would submit, in Babylon. 
We are living today in a culture that is completely without foundation, completely without any moral absolute. And you and I are potentially facing real persecution, just like our brothers and sisters overseas. When you, when you look at the news, you, you, you know, if you're, if you're in touch with Voice of the Martyrs, or if you're in touch with Open Doors, or any of these agencies that work outside of the U.S., your brothers, my sisters, are being martyred every day. You know, they are, they, they are being subjected to phenomenal cruelty because they are unwilling to compromise. They're just like Daniel who stood and he prayed with an open window. He had hope. Daniel had hope in God. The three, the three guys that ended up in the fiery furnace, their, their testimony of faith is amazing to me. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idol. And so, you may be facing a job termination. You may be facing, you know, any number of things because you won't bow down to the idol of the current culture. So, we have this, this incredible set of promises in the Word of God. The Word of God, 66 books... 1,189 chapters, one message, one message. The message is, God wants to know you because he loves you. Genesis to Revelation, the Bible proves that God is intimately involved in, familiar with, and concerned with everything that touches our lives. God's crazy about you guys. This is, this is the most amazing gospel that we have. And we can take it outside of this room, and impact the lives of our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our enemies, people that look at us and would just as soon spit on us, people that hate us. You know, we can take them the gospel that says, God loves you, and I do too. How can I serve you? A question I love to ask, you know, pretty early on in the conversation is, hey, uh, it, how can I pray for you? I was on the phone with a, uh, a client the other day, and he said it's been the, uh, the most wretched week. We had to put down our family dog. My wife's dad died. We had a car accident. And I've known this guy for some time, and I said, Mike, I don't know if you're a man of faith or not. I am. Can I pray for you? And he almost broke down on the phone. He said, that would be wonderful. My wife grew up in the Catholic Church. She's a real woman of faith. You know, I think I'm spiritual. You know, and I wasn't going to hit him between the eyes with, you need to repent, you're a sinner, you know, right then, I was just going to pray for him. And I told, I said, Mike, and I didn't pray on the phone, you know, which I might have done if I was right there looking him in the eye, but I just said, I oh, would be happy to pray for you. What's your wife's name? Therese. Okay, so Mike and Therese are now on my prayer list. We have opportunities every day in simple ways to exalt Jesus Christ. I asked at our um, authentic community meeting, how many people have you asked to come to church this week, this month, this year? You've got an open invitation. It's so easy just to do that. Just to say, my faith has carried me through, you know, some really tough times. Would you like to go to church with me? And just, just hold out the invitation. We've got a Bible study. We've got a men's breakfast once a month. Come check it out. There are a bunch of guys there that you might want to get to know that love Jesus and want to see his kingdom come. They want to see his will be done here on the earth, even as it is in heaven. Because right now, God's will, you know, he is sovereign. He is working all things together for good, for those that love him, for those that he's called according to his purpose. But there's a lot going on in the culture, in the world today, that could be dare I say, should be changed. Yes, it ought to be changed. And I know that because of Jesus Christ's word in the Bible. And I would submit to you that the more we know who God has revealed himself to be, a holy God, you know, is he just concerned about my happiness? No, he wants me to be holy. Matter of fact, he even made a promise that kind of sounds like a, a command. Peter says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. 
What if you read that as God's promise to you? I will be holy because you, Father, are holy. If I'm reflecting my Heavenly Father's nature, if I'm allowing Him to work the character of God in me, whoa, now that's a wonderful thing. It's not, I'm not afraid of Him. I mess up, I fall down on a daily basis. You know, I was having a conversation with Susan the other day, and she says, you know, Richard, that would, that would be great, except that you're really a bully. <laughs> Harvey, are you the one who said the other day we get married and we have wives because they can tell us what's true? Yeah, you did say that. And, and, you know, the next day I got that. So thank you <laughs> for the warning. Right? So I, I'm miserable to be around when I don't get my own way. You know? And that's one area that you really can pray for, Richard. Pray that I would be a humble, gracious man. You know? In this culture, what is espoused is self-reliance, independence, I can get it done. And that's how I grew up. You know, my dad was a career Navy guy. He was gone a lot. At a very early age, I learned how to think for myself and get stuff done. You know, and that's, that's what I do. And God now, by His grace, is saying, let's go do that. Let's take some of that for the kingdom. And what I'm learning, though, is I can see things that ought to be this way, and not many other people do at the same time I do. <laughs> so what, what I'm, I'm learning, painfully, is a little bit of patience, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of gentleness, a little bit of humility. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is a wonderful expression of the character of God, but it's all wrapped up in one package. One package. When you're born again, you are given the Spirit of God. My body is what? A temple. My body, your body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit if Christ is in you. If Christ is in you, you are not the same as you were. You've been born again into a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil by his flesh on that cross. So hope, hope is a wonderful thing. And that's, that's the message that we have in Scripture. So where is the church today? I would say we're in a very precarious position because we have let the culture define the argument. We have let the culture change what we're going to talk about. We've let the culture say, my happiness is paramount. Your speech offends me. Well, do you know what? I have, happen to have as an American, the right of free speech. And gently, but I'm willing to confront somebody with true truth. And that is what I see revealed in Scripture. True truth. Not my opinion, not what I think. I'd rather give you, you know, the Word of God than my opinion. I'd rather, I'd rather just stand up and read Scripture than say, well, here's what I think. So, Listen, these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. This is from Deuteronomy 6. This is why my wife and I homeschool seven kids. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And later we read in Deuteronomy, and you shall love your neighbor like you love yourself. If I'm sinning, if I'm, if, if I'm on the wrong road, wouldn't I love it if somebody came up to me and said, Richard, you're, gone, you're on the wrong road. You need to change the direction that you're headed. Yes, I would love that, especially if it meant that not only in this life I could have the blessing of God, but into eternity I will have eternal life. Oh my, that, that is worth shouting about. That is worth getting out of the, out of the church, out of the pews, and into the street. And... And so we, we look at that, and, and God says, These words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you rise up, when you go out for groceries. You should do that when you're you know, on your trip out to Montana. Talk about what the Bible says. When you sit down for dinner tonight, read a scripture, and then talk about it. What is God saying? What does he mean? How does that scripture impact the way I live my life today? 
Those are good things to think about and talk about. If anyone loves me, Jesus makes this amazing promise. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come with him and be with him. We'll make our home with him. You know, we, we read in the message, God moved into the neighborhood. Jesus Christ became God incarnate in the flesh. Why? Again, his great love for you and me, for Adam and Eve and all their kids. We are one family in Christ Jesus. We are one family. And the world should look at the church and go, that place is just amazing. Do you see how those guys love each other? I mean, they, they will, they will uh, inconvenience themselves for one another. They welcome anybody. Because we know that anybody is invited. Everybody is invited. You know, you've heard Randy say dozens and dozens of times, everyone's welcome at the table. And they are. They are. Everybody is welcome. Let's invite them. Let's bring them in. Let's go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in if needed. You know, because right now this culture is so wrapped up in me. You know, I, I was sitting... I was, uh, where was I? I was sitting, I was sitting in a reception area at, at the doctor's office, and not one person was looking up. Where was everybody? Everybody. Everybody in this room was right there. You know, I felt like standing up and singing, just, just to see what would happen. <laughs> they, they called a guy from the movie acts and locked me up, probably, yeah. So, it, uh, it shocks me. What should bring us together has divided us. What should, what should bring us together has divided us. So, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My dad will love him, I will love him, and we'll come and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not my word, but the Father's who sent me. If you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will know the scripture, read the scripture, apply the scripture to your life. So we can say that the Bible is without mistake and still destroy it if we bend the scripture to accommodate the culture. If we bend the scripture to accommodate our happiness, if we continue to drift away from the clear teaching of scripture, what does the Bible say about itself? That's really important. That's really important. All scripture is inspired by God and it's given for a reason. It's profitable for a reason. It's profitable, first of all, for doctrine. So that I know that I know that I know that my Creator is also my Savior. The one who made me loves me. The one who made you adores you. He's crazy about you. He wants nothing more than to see you with Him in glory for eternity. That is good news. It's profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So again, if I see somebody that is going the wrong way, even in the church, you know, you guys are free.